Welcome to a special Basel Book Company and Books and Company virtual event. It is day 4,711 of Basel being in business and what a wonderful day it is. And to tell you more about why it is so great, I would like to introduce Lisa Bedoin from Books and Company in Economy. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Hi. Um, welcome everybody. It's wonderful because of what we have on board, on board tonight. So. I will introduce everybody. Uh, Lan Samantha Chang was born and raised in Appleton after her parents immigrated from China. So she feels a little bit like home for us. After she graduated from Yale, she attended the Iowa Writers Workshop. Never did she dream though that many years later she would return to Iowa to become the director of the esteemed Iowa Writers Workshop, the first woman and the first Asian American to hold that position. For the past 16 years at the workshop, she has nurtured many budding writers. Lan Samantha Chang is the author of All is Forgotten, Nothing is Lost, Inheritance, Hunger, and most recently, and one of my favorites this year, The Family Chow. And then the um, author Jess Walter calls it a brilliant reimagining of Dostoevsky and a wholly original and gripping story about the passions, rivalries, and searing pressures that royal in a single immigrant family. And that really sort of sums it up for me right there. It's fantastic. And we are honored to welcome Chang Ray Lee, who will be in conversation with Sam tonight. He is the author of several novels, including Native Speaker, Aloft, and The Surrendered, which won the Dayton Peace and Prize and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His most recent novel, My Year Abroad, is now available in paperback. Alexander Chi in the New York Times Book Review called it a wild, ride picaresque, wisecracking, funny, ambitious, full of sex and danger. Chang Ray Lee is the 2021 winner of the Award of Merit for the novel from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He currently teaches writing at Stanford University and is busy influencing and encouraging many writers and one I think that we're going to talk about tonight. So both of you welcome and we are so honored to have you. Sam, do you want to give your little bit of an elevator pitch about um, the family Chow and then read a bit for us? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be in Milwaukee, in Milwaukee. I'm actually joining tonight from, from Northern California, Chang Ray. Oh, you're kidding. Uh, no, <laughs> Are you going to tell me you're down the street? <laughs> I, no, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Sonoma. I'm in Santa Rosa. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it, it's amazing to be here in California and have sun just radiating all over the place to the point where we have to put up screens and things around the room to keep the light out. Yes. It's just shocking at this time of year for me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not Iowa. Um, yeah, so my elevator pitch. I would say this is a, the family Chow is, is a succession drama. Um, there are there's three sons, a tyrannical father, a sort of tranquility seeking mother, a family dog, and there, uh, let's see, there's um, a love story and a sort of vegetarian Buddhist feast and, a, and an omnivore's holiday party and a unexpected death. Mm. Mm. That may be a crime. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so you're going to read for us a little bit Sam? sure I'll just read like the first page and a half okay great okay this first half of the book is called they see themselves for 35 years everyone supported Leo Chow's restaurant introducing choosy newcomers by showing off some real Chinese food in Haven Wisconsin bringing children parents grandparents not wanting to dine out with the Americans, not wanting to think about which fork to use. You could say the manifold tensions of life in the new country, the focus on the future, tracking incremental gains and losses, were relieved by the fine chow. Sitting down under the dusty red lanterns, gazing at Leo's latest calendar with the limp-haired Taiwanese sylphs that Winnie hated so much, waiting for supper, everyone felt calm. In dark times, when you're feeling homesick or defeated, there's really nothing like a good steaming soup and dumplings made from scratch. Winnie and Big Leo Chow were serving scallion pancakes decades before you could find them outside of a home kitchen. 
Leo, 35 years ago, winning his first poker game against the owners of a local poultry farm, exchanged his chips for birds that Winnie transformed into the shining chestnut colored duck dishes of far off cities. Dear Winnie, rolling out her bing the homemade way, two pats of dough together with a seal of oil in between, letting them rise to a steaming bubble in the piping pan. Leo, bargaining for hard to get ingredients. Winnie subbing wax beans for yard long beans, plus home growing the garlic greens, chives, and hot peppers you used to never find in Haven, their garden giving off a glorious smell. You could say the community ate its way through the Chow family's distress, not caring whether Winnie was happy, whether Big Chow was an honest man. Everyone took in food on one side of their mouths, and from the other side, they extolled the parents for their son's accomplishments heaping praise upon the three boys, growing up all bright and ambitious, earning scholarships to good colleges, commending them for leaving the Midwest. Yet everyone was thankful when the oldest, Dago Chow, returned to Haven. Dago, coming home to his mother, moving into the apartment over the restaurant, working there six days a week. Dago, the most passionate cook in the family, Despite the trouble between Winnie and Big Chow, everyone assumed the business would be handed down fairly, peacefully, father to son. Now, a year after the shame, the intemperate and scandalous events that began on a winter evening in Union Station, the community defends its 35 year indifference to the Chow family's troubles by saying, no one could have believed that such good food was cooked by bad people. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. Um, I'm so happy to be talking to you about this great book. Um, you know, the first line that you, one of the lines that you read uh, really spoke to me right from the start, which was, you know, the line, uh, when you're feeling homesick or defeated, there is really nothing like a good steaming soup and dumplings made from scratch. And, and I just, for me, it was a personal thing because, um, you know, we, we're an immigrant family, we're Korean. And we came over in the late '60s, um, and there weren't a lot of Koreans around then. But there, but what there was around were Chinese restaurants. <laughs> and so we, when I think when we felt that way, when we felt a little defeated, when we felt misunderstood, when we felt, I don't know, just like we needed to connect with people, even though we couldn't speak with them, <laughs> uh, we would go to a Chinese restaurant. Uh, but I think it's. But it's not just you know my story about an immigrant family needing some comfort or succor. But I always thought that you know at the Chinese restaurant is a sort of iconic site in American life uh, for in different ways for different people. Obviously, you know a Chinese restaurant in Chinatown in a big city is different than the fine chow in Haven, Wisconsin. Yeah. But but I wondered if you you know wanted to talk a little bit about that and maybe talk about why you decided to set this story here. I mean, you've talked, you know, I know that, you know, you've mentioned the, the brothers Karamazov and how it inspired some of the things in this book, obviously the family drama, the family dynamics, the three sons, the tyrannical, you know, just ass of a father, <laughs> but a great ass. Uh, I don't, maybe that's not the right <laughs> phrase, right. but, 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 but why, you know, why, why was this site, this context, this sort of stage, I don't know, right for, for both you and for the story? Because I'm just curious. Oh, you know, so I grew up, I was born in the mid 60s in Appleton. My parents had been in the US since the early 60s and they were in New York and they moved to Wisconsin right around when I was born. And they discovered a town in which there was no Chinese food or ingredients. Um, they were the only Chinese, according to my big sister, who's 10 years older than me, they were the first Chinese family that they knew to settle in Appleton. And there were, there were three of us at the time, sisters and my parents. Um, my fourth sister would eventually be born in Appleton. Mm -hmm. And um, they ran a kind of test kitchen out of their house. They would basically you know, bring in ingredients from Chicago, like soy sauce. And, and then they would, they would find stuff in the Red Owl supermarket and they would try to turn it into Chinese food. And they became very interested in Chinese cuisine and in cooking. And then later on, um, they began to invite people to the house. I mean, there would be maybe 
relatives sort of traveling through the Midwest by car, stopping at our house, and they would try <laughs> to show them, you know, some what they had managed to cook. Mm -hmm. uh, like my mom used to stir fry iceberg lettuce. Um, <laughs> there were, and then there were there were people, um, you know, that they made friends with who were who were white, and they would bring them home and feed them Chinese type food and, and sort of keep really careful notes on what they ate. My mom showed me these notes. I was always so interested in it. It was like, um, it was like an attempt to share what mattered to them with people who didn't know anything about it really. Mm -hmm. Because before the Vietnam War, um, people didn't have a lot of access to Chinese groceries in Appleton. There was just no way to find it. And eventually a Korean family actually ran a, a grocery store in Appleton and we went there for decades. We went to their store, hmm. um, the Oriental Food Mart, I think. And they um, covered a, a range of things, I suppose. They did, yeah. they did. But I mean, they had Korean food, but they also had just basic things that were not existing as readily in the supermarket. I mean, when my parents moved to Appleton, they didn't have ginger and scallions in the supermarket. Right. And that didn't happen until people started coming back from Vietnam and wanting to eat things. Um, and so food was huge to me. And also I was writing an homage to the brothers Karamazov. So there had to be something to fight about. And it became really clear that the family business um, and the restaurant would be the best vehicle for this particular story, especially since I've, you know, my parents always went to the Chinese restaurants in Appleton and around Appleton, um, just became friends with people one restaurant in particular now they were friends with for many decades and so we knew about their lives right right so that was just something that that was part of your consciousness just yes yeah. the, the 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 flow of people the, the the making of food and you know i i think a reader of this book with you know although of course very early on you talk about the scandal and shame and and warn us that this is not going to yeah. be the typical immigrant story right and, and and that's what i thought you know you pick up the, the the book and you think oh it's they're gonna it's gonna be about a family and and you know the typical sort of travails and you know you know the kinds of you know a low level domestic intrigue yeah. <laughs> that might go on <laughs> oh, uh, but of course right away things start happening um, in plot. And I don't, don't want to give away the book, but, you know, there's a, there's a, the, one of the sons, James, comes upon uh, on coming home from college uh, back to Haven, uh, encounters an older Chinese man uh, in, at the train station who ends up dying and leaving a bag. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, he doesn't know it, but it, it may turn out to be a bag of a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, and this sort of, it, 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 I thought it was great because it just, it just propelled me into a completely different kind of story. Um, a story that, you know, regardless of what I, you know, think about the brothers Karamazov and their troubles about money in that novel, um, I thought it was a wonderful way to, to kind of uh, leap out of any kind of story that people thought you might be interested in writing. And I guess I, and I guess I wondered, you know, when that came about and, and how, how the, you know, how did it fit, how did the brothers Karamazov figure, but then of course, how did your own, you know, crafting and construction of the story, you know, what, what was the seed of that? Was it, was it like a, a moment like that, like the bag of money or, or did you have, you know, another destination or at least a provisional destination in mind when you, when you started plotting well, this? I did not know what I was doing when I started the novel. I have a terrible time when I'm in between projects. So I was just scratching away on paper or in my computer and then just putting it aside for a year. I think I started three projects in the year 2005 and this was one of them. One of them was the novel I published in 2010, mm -hmm. which is a totally different kind of book. Um, but I started writing, I wrote a hundred pages because it was so much fun in the present tense. Mm. I had never, I'd always told my students never to write in the present <laughs> tense. And I was punished because I discovered that for me, it was a blast. And it also reminded me of the Chinese language, which does not have the past tense in the same way mm -hmm. um, that English does. And so there was something really um, exciting about doing it. And, and I wrote about a family with a tyrannical father and three kids. And then I set it aside because I could feel that there was no plot. 
Like I could just feel it. Mm. Um, I, at some point, maybe eight years later, it was 2013, I was talking to a student who said that he likes, to, he was writing a, a novel project that was very similar to The Good Soldier by Ford Maddox Ford in its unreliability and it's sort of turning narrative mm -hmm. and that sense of being like close to a consciousness that isn't entirely reliable. And, uh, and, he, and he said, I like, to, I like to pattern my books on other books. And I thought, you know, what would be a really interesting thing would be to take that present tense and try to read it, use it to like, I don't know, just to develop that sense in the Brothers Karamazov that things are unfolding and surprising right in front of you for mm -hmm. like the first five, 600 pages, you know, it takes place over three days and you just follow the characters around as they have conversations and, and fights and encounters um, and, and they eat, you see everything they eat, um, <laughs> which I found fascinating and, and interesting. Um, and, uh, and I thought it'd be cool to do that in the present tense. And I thought, then I thought it'd be cool to try to write an homage. The, um, the pleasure of the homage really surprised me, but it was actually quite challenging for me until I put the book away. I had been reading the book pretty much obsessively for years, teaching it over and over, even non-credit classes, discussion classes. I taught one at, I taught a bookshop at Warren Wilson. I know there's people here from Warren Wilson, Liam and CJ and Vanessa. And, and, and so um, one of my bookshops was on that book and, I just wanted to find people to talk about it with. And then I decided to just immerse myself in it as a creative project. The bag, however, has nothing to do with the Brothers Karamazov, except that that book is concerned with money. And there's a lot of obsession that one character has with trying to get money. And I am fascinated by particular ways in which my dad and my dad, who's somewhat like Leo, but not an immoral person, <laughs> but he was always thinking about money and people that I knew who would, people like Chinese Americans that I knew, older older usually, who would collect money from years of toil and keep it in cash. You know, this idea of having cash around because it's right there and you yeah. have it and you trust that it's there. Um, I started thinking it would be really cool to sort of work on that idea of a life savings, you know, somebody's life savings and what would happen to it. Um, that is really kind of unrelated to the Brothers Karamazov, but it was a way to start off the book. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. something to follow. That's, that's great. Uh, and of course, the, the, the son, there are three sons in this novel and they're all very different um, as the, the sons are in, in the Brothers Karamazov. But I, I particularly love the way you created these characters. There's Dagu, the uh, the number one son, the oldest son, who's, you know, he's got a beautiful white American girlfriend and he's, um, you know, he's, he's just so much, it has so much sort of, I don't know, physical presence and energy. There's Ming, who's the more intellectual, you know, kind of, um, he's, he's someone who's, who's skeptical, um, uh, very smart. Uh, he's the striver, but, but, but the, but, but a striver who's obviously paid a price for all that striving. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's James. And I always wa I wanted to ask you actually about James because he's, he's uh, like Alexei uh, Karamazov. He's, he's the more gentle one. He's, I guess he's has an optimistic view of people in the world. And I, and I wondered if, if, uh, if he were in some ways the secret hero of the novel, you know, in, in, you know, in a way that, because obviously lots of things happen in the book, there, there's some revelations, um, but, but there's, a, there's a sense that James is the one who's going to maybe move off in the world and have to deal with all this. Uh, so I wondered if you could talk about the brothers and their relationships, but particularly if you want to, uh, I, I would just love to hear what you thought about James. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the, the waif uh, at this point. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, he's the innocent. I, a lot of comic novels have a, an innocent character. Mm -hmm. The way I thought of him, actually, I often thought of him when I was writing the novel as the fool in the tarot deck and the waif rider tarot deck. 
who has sort of his possessions over his shoulder and he's walking along in a kind of um, sort of innocent way, uh, just heading off into the world without knowing what is happening, what's going to happen to him. And I kind of imagine that, you know, at the end of this book, James is, has been through a lot. Um, he's in a completely different place than he was at the beginning of the book when he's a pre-med student who just wants to be a good, a good kid and do what he's supposed to do and he wants to be an ordinary person. He's told early in the novel by the abbess of his mother's um, sort of Buddhist community that he's not going to be ordinary, that he's going to become you know, a big powerful person with, and make a lot of money and lose a lot of money and become um, you know, somebody that he can't even, can't even recognize at that time. And I do imagine that that's what's going to happen to James eventually. Um, you know, it's interesting The Dostoevsky original, Brothers Karamazov is, people have called it a, a hagiography um, where it's basically following the character of Alyosha. Um, he becomes, Dostoevsky is going to write a sequel to this book and in the sequel, um, Alyosha was, you know, going to become the major character, uh, you know, a bigger character than he is in this book. And, you know, I imagine that that would also be James. I don't know if that makes sense. The other brothers I had a really good time with. Um, I always think, I was always fascinated by the idea of the brother that comes home because, you know, the oldest brother who was basically spoiled by the parents leaving the home and going into a world in which he's not mm -hmm. the wonderful oldest child of the Chinese family, the big, the big son, but just a guy who can't quite get it together, doesn't quite have the toughness that's necessary to succeed, and so comes home. Um, and, and Ming himself, uh, yeah, Ming's quite troubled, but I feel like one of the reasons he's so different from his other brothers is that at a very young age, he decides that he's not going to take the family as it was, um, the family as his own. He decides, no, I want to be somebody with a different family. I wanna be different. I, I wish I'd, I'd rather be white. Um, I'm gonna go out in the world and I'm gonna succeed and, and beat everyone. I'm gonna be better than everyone. He's, he's got a chip on his shoulder because his older brother is the oldest. Um, gets the most attention, uh, and he just um, he he does all these things. He becomes a success in in the American sense of the word, and a success to his parents. But but it, there's a there's a sort of emotional price to pay in that way for sort of abandoning his his culture. Yeah, I mean, he has this uh, long section in the in early on, well, about the first third of the book that. Where he talks about the second himself, he talks about the second son, and and he goes on quite a bit, which yeah, is yeah. which you is know, cool, chapters. you know, which <laughs> which is very Dostoevsky. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I remember re I I know reading that speech, and I'm just like looking at it now. I mean, the the things that he says, um, he's so he he's so clear eyed about who he is. And, and how it's affected him. He says, the second son pays very careful attention to appearances because he knows that in our outer lives, lives lie success because the balance sheet is a fingerprint of fortune's favor because only in the numerable, the countable can you find certainty and only in certainty can you find truth. Um, uh, so it, it, it's, it's chilling to me because he's, he, he understands himself so well. Um, and I love that about the book, uh, uh, about how, how you'll actually let the characters really go and really speak. I think, you know, if they, I think in, in terms of like, if you read this in a student story, you'd probably say, hey, wait a minute, you know, it's, this is verging on maybe something not so realistic, quote unquote. Quote unquote, realistic. Quote unquote, right, quote what unquote. Does that mean? You're right, exactly. And you also do this, you also let uh, Dagu speak in a, through his radio show. Yeah, uh, I noticed. And I love the I love the fact that you you take advantage of these moments to to kind of bend the form a little bit. And I wondered I wondered if you, you know, just just to say to, that the novel is capacious enough for Dagu to have this radio show where he can just riff and go off and 
And I, I, I'd love to hear more about that, uh, you know, it just in that, you know, if you can remember that moment sure. when you're working on it, or if it's something that you had, you know, early intentions of doing about allowing, you know, obviously scenes are going to happen, there's action, but then you seem to have this real interest and love of letting people kind of go, you know, yeah. letting, yeah. I, it began with this idea of writing in the present tense. Mm. This idea back to the present tense, tense which you, the, which you didn't I, want your students to write. No, I, mean, I always I, thought because it didn't seem realistic. Like it doesn't exist. You don't sort of have things unspooling as you read them. Life does not unfold at, at the same time that the reader is reading it. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 it doesn't exist. But I but I um I just enjoyed it and I wanted to create a narrative in which things really did unspool in a surprising way. And I've been fascinated for years by the tale, the form of the tale. Um, okay, so in John Gardner's The Art of Fiction, he says there are three different kinds of fictions. One is the, one is the yarn, one is the tale, and one is, quote, the realistic short story. And I'm just gonna leave that there. But, but I've been fascinated, I was fascinated a long time by this idea of, tales because they they do not have flashbacks like if you look at fairy tales or other tales the past is rendered in the present so um somebody could run into a character who would tell them their story in a tale but you would never have the narrator flashback and like show the story mm -hmm. and so i just wanted to do that i wanted to write something that was really voice driven mm -hmm. um, more verbal just more verbal and john larue um at stanford once told me that um, for every 10 lines of narrative, you, you can have one line of dialogue that is very <laughs> sparing with dialogue. But I don't know. I mean, this whole book was kind of a rebellion against ways I've been taught to write. Um, I grew up in a family. So I wrote a book, my first book, which I'm very proud of and you know, wrote under the tutelage of many, you know, very, great writers and teachers, I think. Um, it, it described these immigrant families living these sort of quietly unhappy lives. Like there's this, at one point that I described, there's a hole in the house. Um, it's where all these words that aren't spoken go into. So there's a silence um, and some, you know, powerful unhappiness, very muted, like mm -hmm. um, low key stuff with few words in it. And I remember when I was writing it, there was one story that I feel like I just failed to capture what I wanted to capture. And it was a story in which uh, the dad and the oldest sister were fighting. And I have vivid memories of my father and my oldest sister fighting when I was little. And when you're really small and someone, people around you are having like a loud, you know, altercation, it feels like things are falling apart. Like anything could happen at any moment. I mean, at least it did for me. I would you know, um, they fought constantly because of your basic usual rules. Like she wanted to go out and he didn't want her to because that was not appropriate. You know, your basic how to behave well as a Chinese daughter fights, but she always fought back and, and he just escalated everything. My dad was this incredibly emotional, incredibly dramatic person. I mean, just, you know, he had, he had an outsized personality and all of us grew up in this very talkative, very verbal, loud, unhappy family. And I thought, well, why don't I ever see anything like that? Like, why can't I find that? Because that, that, would, that would be what happened to me. And then, um, then I read Dostoevsky and I thought, okay, I found the person. <laughs> I found the person who gets it. Right. And I don't know if it's realistic or not realistic. I suppose it's not American realism, such as I was taught. But like I use a ton of exclamation points. People are screaming at each other in italics. People scream for, you know, a page and a half. People, you know, fight back and forth. I'm telling people that they're living lives of immigrants, living lives of noisy unhappiness. You know, <laughs> and so they also and they also blog in this novel. And yes, you yes. you use the blog. You use the comment section. Yeah. Uh, you, there you avail yourself of all the all these modes, which I thought was great and. But going back to those rules of writing and particularly yeah. rules of writing that, you know, maybe, I mean, I'm not going to accuse of any, anyone about, about, of this, but 
I think there was, you know, especially maybe 20 years ago when we were still starting out as writers, there's a sense of a, a kind of story that a kind of tenor to the stories that we would write, right? Muted, yeah. intense. Yeah. Um, and then of course, in this book, we get where we have to deal with the, 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 the huge figure of Leo Chow. Who <laughs> just, I mean, he talk about talk about someone who who you know every step he takes is is sort of you know destroying the floor, you know, and and unsettling everything. And so so I guess you know hearing you talk about your father, I, he must have been a part of the inspiration because that was one of the he's you know he's an, an amazing character, Leo. Um, uh, so so he's ribald, he's sensual, he's. I mean, he, he he talks about his his sons and and their and sex acts. I mean, he he he's he's not like any quote unquote you know Chinese immigrant that we're that we're that we tend to see. And right. We haven't encountered that person. No, we haven't encountered that person. And I guess I wanted to ask you, given what you were saying, um, you know, how why is that? I mean, what what and what are we as say? you know, Asian American writers, writers of a certain ethnicity, or right? I mean, do we, I, I mean, this is something that happened in your family. My ha my family happened to be kind of quiet. <laughs> they didn't have fights. So, but I kind of wanted them to. <laughs> um, but how do we break out of, I don't know, it, did it take you a long time to, to, to feel like, A, you could write about a character who is sort of like your dad or, or, or is this something that, uh, I don't know, that it, a new thing that we should be talking about, you know, that it, to our students, rather than just, you know, 10 lines of narrative and then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then a piece yeah. of dialogue. Ray Conroy told his son, Tim, that you're allowed to use two exclamation points in your entire life. <laughs> I mean, I think I have 419 exclamation points yes. in the novel. <laughs> yes. and, and, the, and the Brothers Karamazov has like 2,300. Does it really? Yeah. Uh, At least a friend of mine counted it on one of those machines. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess I feel that everyone can write any way they want to, mm. but, but I felt myself freed when I was able to describe a family that did not, did not exist um, for me on the page before I found them. And my dad, larger than life. I mean, like, I can't, I haven't even gotten started about what my dad was like in this novel in a way. Um, you know, he, he I wanted I wanted to be able to give him a give him a space um, or give people like my dad a space. I don't think, I mean, I once walked into a restaurant in a city that will remain nameless and looked in the kitchen because I'm always really curious. Um, and there was a man staring back at me. His face was red, his hair was spiky. He was, I don't know how old, but like big and just had this intense look on his face. And I thought, that's, that's the man. Like that is, that man, I wanna write about that man. I don't wanna just write about people who behave because mm -hmm. I guess what I realized was um, my dad did this one thing that I remember really clearly. Sometimes we would go on trips and he would have to, sit in a cab you know with us he would always tip the driver extra and I'm thinking why did you do this and he told us it was because he does not want them to go around thinking that Chinese people are cheap and he felt this responsibility I think to represent all Chinese people in this country that was majority white and he felt like he had to behave to a certain extent um, and he's not the only person I know who feels that way. People who feel if we only behave perfectly, then the dominant culture will A, either ignore us so that we don't get into any trouble or B, they'll think, um, they'll think well of us because we're different and we don't want to be thought ill of. And so there's this, there's this long, long way going back um, sense that we have to behave well or else we will, mm. you know, white people will not like us. And I guess I just got sick of that. I got really sick of that. I, I, and I also don't think, I got sick of behaving, one. Two, I don't think it works. I don't think that if all Asian writers write like really quiet, well-behaved, sympathetic characters, like characters that everyone can relate to, 
that that the world is going to change their mind and that suddenly there isn't going to be violence against Asians in the streets. I just don't think it's going to make it's not going to help. In, instead, I would like a world where Asians can be the way they want to be or be the characters that they are. And that's that's what I'm writing and trying to write. I, I do seem to be stepping into a moment though, where perhaps what I should be doing is writing like perfectly martyred characters, but I just got, I just got tired of it. No. Well, that, that idea of misbehaving as a writer, as people too, but as a writer are allowing ourselves, I think that's a, a hugely big, you know, step in, in a writer's life. I mean, I, and not to say that you, you know, you made any, it's, it's something that we try to do all the time but maybe are afraid to do, or we're just, again, we're, you know, some of us who are just used to have been, you know, like students, right? We, 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 we were, I was always told, you know, respect all your teachers. And they, and I think, I think that's part of it. And I, in my teaching, I, I try to get people to, to make these little transgressions uh, in any way, language, plotting, you know, uh, characterization. And I wondered if, if you know you could talk a little bit about the kinds of the kinds of things you keep saying seem like you keep needing to say to your students uh i don't know of any level if there's if there's something that maybe you know more beginning students that 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 seems to come up for you if, if there's anything like that beginning <laughs> students i mean with or, or any students it doesn't well, have to with be beginning students so they they it's important to write about what you care about no matter what it is I think that's, and, you, and to really put yourself out there. And I think that's very hard. And I think I give a version of that to my workshop students at the MFA program at Iowa, where mm -hmm. I, I often go into the first class and say, um, in this class, you will not get in trouble for being grandiose or sentimental. Because I feel like words like that, which are often sort of, sort of bandied about in writer's workshops of various kinds, just as a, an attempt to shut down the writer. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I, I do think so. Um, I was inspired also by an essay Charles Baxter wrote called Making a Scene, where he talks about how, you know, in the workshop, people feel uncomfortable about making a scene. And I think scenes are interesting. And it, yeah. All right, that's <laughs> um, the coffee business. Yeah, the coffee. Yeah, business. yeah. There's the right, of course. And we see it here. Right, right, right. I should have had him stand on the table or something. <laughs> <laughs> Spill it on himself and over yeah. his head. Um, so I do want to just get to you know, there's one question and maybe get back to the book uh, a little bit. Um, and it's a question from uh, David Malman. He says, "I know it would be hard to talk much about Olan without giving too much away." But can you talk about where she came about in the writing process? What inspired you to bring her into the story? And, and I guess I just have a, a you know, a, a, an addendum to that is I wanted to talk about plotting in the, in the yeah. novel because, it, because the novel, again, if we haven't talked about it enough, it becomes a, a murder mystery. Uh, there's a trial. There's, um, you know, there, there's a lot of just, moving parts uh, uh that are that are coming together in terms of uh you know what what i would say is just a you know a very propulsive and and engaging plot and olan of course is uh she is uh just a as we first meet we meet her very early on she's just one of the workers in the in the restaurant she tends to you know she figures much much bigger later on in the novel but but uh but maybe you could talk about her and, and also maybe just plotting in general. Sure. And, and do you like plotting? <laughs> and, it, and is it, does this something that, that, that you really enjoyed in this novel or is it, was it something that you felt like, oh gosh, you know, it's, it's just a lot of stuff to handle. Olan, um, <laughs> she is named after the first wife in the good earth mm. yes. uh, by Perlis Buck, the martyred, um, wife. Uh, she basically keeps the restaurant going. She does a lot of the hard work in the restaurant. And it's interesting because these are Chinese immigrants. They have a family business and who do they hire and sort of oppress, but another Chinese immigrant. <laughs> um, I wanted to put that in there. I, I, I found it interesting. I, I don't think it's un, I don't think it's uncommon. 
uh, the plot. I became interested in plot somehow through osmosis in the last 15 years without even realizing it was happening to me. Mm. One reason is that I, okay, I wrote my first book and I, I do still love my first book, Hunger, but I, I got one negative review for that book. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm like most books, that one got really positively reviewed, but there was one negative review and I thought about it um, and it was helpful. Uh, where the reviewer said that everything in this book is so sad. Um, there's no happy moment in the book. Like if it were, if you were really going to write and make people understand how sad something was, there should be happiness or some other thing. And I started thinking, wow, that, that requires this, you know, it, it was relating to something that had been bothering me as I was re writing and reading and, and then continued to um, interest me for 20 years, which, or more, and up until the present moment, which is about how to create a sense of scope, um, how to create a sense of like size in the work. Um, and I tried it in different ways. Like uh, in the next book, it was a historical book and it took place over seven decades. And, um, you know, I just tried really hard to sort of make it longer and take up more time. Um, that was one way of, of making the book bigger. And then in another, the next book, I, it was a very quiet book, but um, it, it also jumped in time. And, and, one, and I was interested in the idea of characters who sort of believe in something larger than themselves. And in the case of the book, um, many of the characters believed in art. They believed in poetry, um, in pursuing poetry. And then another character believed in God you know, it was very, very devout. I just wanted to make bigger things come into the work. And then with this one, I began to see that if I was going to create a, a book in which a lot happened, like the extremes of human behavior happen in this book, um, you know, people fall in love, people, um, you know, somebody, somebody, there's a terrible accident, or maybe it's not an accident and somebody's dead, or maybe he's killed. Um, you know, that just, I wanted to create all of that. And it felt to me like I needed um, scaffolding, not scaffolding, that's not the right word, but kind of like a skeleton or some kind of structure for it that would make it move and contain all of it. And it occurred to me that plot is one way in which people do contain these things. So I became, actually, I had a great time with the plot is very strange i had a really good time with it it felt like that yeah it felt like that i mean and maybe the where i felt that was lynn chin's blog where you know she's the she's the student who's like um who's giving the running account of the trial and all the all the reactions perceptions misperceptions um you know all this all the kind of you know lingual flack that that we that you know gets shot about in, in in situations like this, and I felt like you had you delighted in, in through her. It was just about everything you've kind of you know established and let go. Um, you were kind of like oh, it was almost as if I felt like I felt like I was watching the writer just you know kind of say here here I gave here was the plot, and now I'm going to say gee I'm enjoying this plot <laughs> and all the kind of you know crazy stuff that happens. Um, I mean, she's sort of a representation of the community narrator in mm -hmm. the Brothers Karamazov, this first person omniscient narrator who seems to know all the gossip and what everybody's <laughs> thinking and feeling. And will occasionally say like later he thought this or he told everybody this and then later he said this. Um, she is that person, she's mm -hmm. the community narrator. She absolutely is. And I wondered if, because I had the thought too, is like, was she ever actually the whole narrator of the novel? And that, that <laughs> you know, I mean, was there I a different know. form of the novel where, was there a different form of the novel where you had someone like that? Uh, I tried, I tried to write a novel in which there was a community person, but I ran into this problem and I'm curious to know if it happens in your work where I had this community of immigrants. And the question was, if you're going to do a first person narrator about like a large community, would it, what generation would that person be from? Mm. Like, mm. would it be an older person who's mm. seen the old country, et cetera, and, and actually immigrated? Or would it be, um, 
would it be at one of the children? And as one of the children, as a member of that generation, I was pretty much not exactly bored by that generation's narration, but I wanted something that was less located in, in a specific generation. So I made it sort of a community omniscience um, for the narrator. And I suppose you could say maybe Lynn, I mean, Lynn has this conflict in the first half of the book, which is that she wants to be a journalist and, or she wants to major in journalism and her parents are just, just devastated. I mean, they, they just feel like she's lost any chance that she ever will have of becoming like a success or success, less successful or happy person in any way. Um, but uh, so when she, when she starts her assignment, I have her following really carefully the rules of how to write a blog, which I actually found online. And they include things like include bullet points, don't, don't have paragraphs longer than three months. Really? Like, <laughs> yeah, all that stuff. And then she gradually, as she comes into herself and her own perceptions of the trial breaks the rules of the blog. And so she gets a bad grade. Um, but I, I felt like I know that person, that person's gonna grow up and become a novelist. She's mm -hmm. not going to be a journalist because she can't stick to the format. Yes. Um, and so, so yeah, who knows? Maybe she grew up and wrote this, but I don't know. <laughs> well, I always I felt immediately that that she was sort of the spirit guide of the writer in this <laughs> in this story. Um, we're we're sort of getting towards the end of the time, but I wanted to ask um, about a particular quote that um, or a, a little section that you wrote about through Ming's point of view uh, towards the end of the novel, and it's about immigrants. If I could just read it. Um, this is after you know all, everything has kind of happened and we don't want to get into the the details but he, so he says that you write this are the chows immigrants anymore ming wonders as he searches for the reflection in the steam covered mirror are they still an immigrant family now that their mother and father are gone after all the all the passions they spent the transgressions they've committed in haven and i thought that was a uh, a really telling and interesting line and I, I wanted you to it made me think about you know my own immigrancy and and when people become something else or if they can ever become something else and if they become that other thing what is that if especially if they've known themselves in a certain identity and so I, I wondered if you could just talk about that line and, and talk about that you know that idea yeah I was struggling over that um question the whole I'd say second half of writing this book and one reason is that my parents both of my parents passed away while I was writing this book the book took a super long time my mom died in 2014 mm. which was right when I was really getting started on the book um and then my dad died in 2020 um he was 97 and a half uh he'd been through like so many different historical events in different places. It's really sort of fascinating to me. Um, I wondered, you know, without my parents, the connection that I have, uh, that I used to have to China has, is becoming more and more distant. And I am, meanwhile, I'm moving forward in time and becoming more and more of an American. Um, and The thing that's ironic to me about this is that I realized as I was, after I had written these lines, that the characters in the book who are struggling with these questions, you know, who feel like they've made their ghosts in this country and so it is theirs, they are still looked upon by the many of the surrounding um, people in, in the town, but also in the world as newcomers. And so that's that's an irony that I think Asian American immigrants face that uh, maybe a Russian immigrant might not feel. Mm. Just because of obviously the way we look. Yeah. 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 And that so and that feeling that feel, that disconnect between, you know, the 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 career of someone's belonging, getting yeah. to a certain point, but but the. On, you know the misrecognition or no recognition at all yeah um you know i guess how does that figure in in the soul right or in yeah in, yeah, yeah yeah who are you are you who you are how do others see you how much mm -hmm. does that have an impact on who you are yeah yeah and i thought that was you know a, 
uh, a really a really kind of moving and 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 I think thorny question for me at the end of the novel. And I think that's what one of the things I liked so much about the book. Obviously, it's a it, first of all I haven't talked about and and asked you about how how you know it's just such a funny book too all throughout. <laughs> You're a funny person, but it that doesn't always translate to the book. And there's just so many funny observations and lines. So, and, and of course, a, a book of so much vitality, but, but by the end, I think, I think you've, you've, you've broached so many important um, and, and really uh, kind of uh, undeniably difficult questions <laughs> about, about how, how people are situated in a place. And, and how that place is a huge influence on who they are. Not notwithstanding that, they, that these people all have these big personalities and, and certain trajectories, but, but that those trajectories are, you know, are also a, a product of, of everything that's gone around them, right? I mean, this is Haven, Wisconsin here, right? Yeah. I, you, well, and and, I, and I, guess, I guess I wanted to say, say is like, if this place, if they, that, if Fine Chow were somewhere else, maybe it couldn't be anywhere else. Maybe that's the answer to the question. I don't know, because I only grew up in one place. I spent uh, eight years of my life in Wisconsin. Um, I tried to create a city that didn't have a real name. And I looked up a list of cities in Wisconsin and Haven was not on there, but it turns out there is a Haven, Wisconsin, <laughs> incorporated, mm -hmm. but it's not that. It's a fictional city. I don't know. I don't know if this could have been. I thought about this just recently. I mean, this interesting question, would the, would this have been able to take place anywhere else? And I, I can't answer that question. I, um, I felt when I was writing the book that I had to do very little research. I was just sort of remembering how it felt. <laughs> um, and, you know, details from growing up where I did. Uh, and then the story kind of grew out of that. Mm -hmm. not, not a very profound answer but I don't know what do you think about your do you feel in your work that um, that it's growing out of a place specifically places where you've been I don't I don't think you know in thinking about Haven and the fine chow I just don't it, I don't think it can happen anywhere else okay I, I, my feeling is that, you know, as with every, you know, wonderful novel, it's its own ecosystem that cannot, cannot exist in another place. And that ecosystem, you know, all the, all the influences, the pressure, the, the players, the atmosphere, you know, that's what makes Dagu Dagu. That, that's, that's what makes Ming Ming. That may be, and not to say that people aren't a certain nature. Leo Chow, I'm sure, would be a big, big fellow in any place he is. Yeah. But maybe he's warped in certain ways that he wouldn't have been had he sure. had he been somewhere else. And that's the and and that's what you're mining here, right? You're mining the ways in which they have a little community with the spiritual house, but but uh, but they're also still, of course perennial newcomers yes and 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 subject subject i think to to the climate that that has has surrounded them and and nurtured them and made made possible their lives so mm. but but it was a great novel and i'm i'm just so uh i'm just so happy to have talked to you about it uh, oh, it's always great to so talk much. to you it's it's a huge honor to have conversation with you about it and thanks so much Oh. For reading it and liking it yeah well so i i think that's i don't know daniel um i i, I don't know either um let me just <laughs> let me just um i do always one of our um one of my booksellers said don't forget daniel that if people come late they don't always get the link to purchase the book and so oh, i'm just going to send it out again with um both of our stores and um, and then thank you for a really wonderful, wonderful, um, as somebody said, inspiring. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, conversation. Um, we are uh, thrilled to be selling. Uh, books been on our bestseller list every week since it's come out, which has been very exciting. Wow. Um, 
And I've never written a book that people buy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I didn't think I could love the book more, but this conversation has just really strengthened what I felt. Well, thanks. Thank you. I mean, it was, Changri, it was amazing talking to you yeah. about it because being in conversation with somebody who's, you know, essentially like of my generation about it and an Asian, an Asian American writer of great, you know, brilliance is just a real, real honor for me. Well, it's, it's so fun. It's just, it feels so natural. So that's what's great. Thank you so much to both of you. Continued success. Thank you everybody to, for coming. We wouldn't have independent bookstores without you and hope to see you at another event. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Bye, Sam. See you soon. Bye, Chang Ray. Okay. Bye. Bye.